conversation with Dr. Phil. No, the real Dr. Phil. We wanted to talk today uh, and speak at the end of the day because you guys are all inspired, right? You've, you've seen inspiring talks today, you're being inspired. And so we know that you're going to want to do something when you leave tonight, do something tomorrow, next week. So I wanted to talk to Phil today about his work in studying heroism. What is it that makes us do heroic things? Um, so I'm going to start right with that. So Phil, what are some things that we, we could start doing tonight as, as a sort of habit to get ready for heroic action? Right. Uh, we've heard so many wonderful talks. I must say, last year was inspiring. This year is awesome, really, truly awesome. So, uh, thanks to all the speakers and thanks to the audience. I think it's having so many young people, students here, that we, we uh, all the speakers have picked up your energy. Uh, so many of the speakers have given ideas about things to do, uh, and I want to just add to that. So really, um, heroism is, should be a social habit. It's not a one-time deed. Like many of the wonderful examples you've heard on the Titanic and other places, people were ha happened to be in a situation where they, they, they either took heroic action or they didn't. Uh, we're trying to promote the mentality, the heroic imagination. So heroism starts in the mind, thinking of yourself as first a hero in waiting, waiting for a situation in which you can act, and then really hero in training, which means every day it is possible to do a small heroic deed. And I'll give you some examples. And so that it becomes automatic. So when you, finally, when you're in a situation, some emergency situation, you can act without uh, much thinking. First of all, it really means, and several speakers have touched on this, it's developing situational awareness. I grew up in a ghetto in the South Bronx, and we used to call it street smarts. Any situation you went in, you always checked it out. You checked out what was, who, who you could trust, who might be dangerous. Uh, you always sat with your back to the wall so nobody could, could come behind you and, and, and you know, either steal your wallet or hit you on the head. So situational awareness means <clears throat> whenever a situation you go in, you check out. You check, for, for example, you check out the exits, but you check out who are the people, what are they doing, who seems to be the leader, who are the followers, uh, who, who, is, who are potentially dangerous people, uh, uh, and where do you fit in, especially when you're in a new situation? So that, that when something suddenly arises, that uh, you are now more familiar. For example, um, many young people have died in fires at rock concerts. And the reason they've died is that they, and they didn't get burned to death, they got crushed at the exit. And what it, what it turns out is that everybody rushed to the same exit that you came in on, even though there were many other exits. So somebody yells, fire, it's an emergency, and we go into this uh, survival mode. And it's not women and children first, it's me, my ass first, get, trying to get out. <laughs> and so what you do then is, in all of these situations, people ran for the exit that they entered, they ran for the exit, which was the entrance they came in on, when there were many other e exits that they could have gone on. And in fact, all they needed to do was one person to say, stop, go here. So in many cases, the really important thing is for you as an individual to analyze what's happening, even in an emergency, and be willing to take action, to stand up, we call it speak out, to say, stop, that's wrong, go here. So heroes stand up, they're noticed, they speak out, they're willing to say what they think is, is necessary in an emergency situation or other situations. It also means, for example, uh, some of our speakers this morning said, you know, we have to listen to our parents, we have to listen to our teachers, and we have to respect them for their status. However, there are some parents, there are some teachers who sometimes tell us the wrong thing. There are some teachers, there are some parents who in fact are prejudiced. Prejudice, racially prejudiced, uh, uh, et, cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so your job also as a family member is learning how to graciously uh, give them the information they need that they should not be saying things about blacks or Hispanics or Jews or, 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 or Sicilians, whatever. Uh, and how do you do that? Especially at holidays, there's always Uncle Charlie who tells a funny joke and it's always a sexual racial joke. 
And people, they don't laugh anymore, but you know, it, it's, you put up with it. Well, really, how do you deal with that? So this is learning a skill. You take Uncle Charlie on the side, for example, I'm using this as a general model. You say, gee, Uncle Charlie, I, I love the way you try to tell jokes to make everybody happy. And, you know, but the only problem is when you tell that joke about, about women's breasts or butt or something, it's really not funny. It's really offensive to the women. And, and they don't say anything. So I, I think it would be better if you had told a different joke. So you always begin with, I love you, you, give them, you say something nice, I like the fact that you're trying to make our dinner friendly, but you're doing it the wrong way. And this is very hard to do, but it takes practice. So practice first in your mind, thinking about it, but it's the same way. You have a teacher who says, uh, in fact, uh, a former student of mine who was a great teacher, taught at University of Southern California. Uh, uh, um, he actually got trained in how to use humor in his lectures. And a lot of the humor he used was sexual. And I'm sorry to say, it's uh, uh, tits and ass jokes. And he would say it and everybody would laugh. No, 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 the guys would laugh, the women wouldn't. And so, but he couldn't tell until one day a woman in class, when he told a joke, went shh. And he looked around, who's that? She, just, she put a note in his mailbox to say, do you realize what you're doing is offensive to me and other women? From, and he got up the next class and he apologized. He said, I'm so sorry, I didn't know, I didn't realize it. You know, it was my ignorance. And, to, and so he never did that again. So that woman was heroic. Now she doesn't have to say, hey, it was me, but she took action. She stood up, spoke out and took action, which changed an undesirable negative behavior. And again, he apologized publicly and he says, I feel guilt for all the years I was doing that. I was just trying to be funny, but I did it in the wrong way. So standing up, speaking out, uh, taking action. One of the things I do in my, so why, uh, why aren't people more heroic? So really to be a hero means to do the right thing when other people are doing the wrong thing or more often when other people are doing no thing. So the big bystander problem is that we all know bullying is going on. We've, we've all been in classes since almost kindergarten where there was a bully and the problem was not that we didn't oppose the bully. The problem is we didn't go to the kid who was being bullied, our friend, and say, gee, I'm really sorry. You know, so the, many people feel shame for not, not even having done that. So, so the question is, why don't we take action? In some cases, it's too important for us to be liked. We go along to get along. And that's the power, negative power of group conformity. Um, and, and then we, we set, you don't realize that a lot of what you think is your taste, the way you dress, the way you carry your books, the kind of music you like, like et cetera, uh, your, your favorite actors, singers, so forth, are really your friends. So one way, one tactic we use is practice one day being a deviant. We call it being a positive deviant because as one of our speakers said, heroes are always deviant. Because most people, you look around, most people are doing nothing. In order to take action, you have to break the power that the group has to pull you back to do nothing. And so we do exercise like um, put, put a, uh, with a magic marker, uh, an erasable one, put a square on your forehead. Okay? People say, what is that? It's a square on my forehead. Take it off. People get crazed. Now, it's a special, you've got to put it on early in the morning and it's, it's, it's got to be erasable because the pressure is going to be like this. Uh, and and your parents will say, what is that? It's a, it's a square. Take it off. And you will see, person after person, will, you say, look, it's me. It's no different. I'm just, I'm just doing something. If you can go one day without erasing that, suddenly you realize the power you have, that you can break the power that the group has on you. Okay. And so I do this in my class at Stanford, and students do whatever they want. I mean, um, it's, you know, kids who usually dress a certain way dress exactly opposite. Kids who are shy go around the, the, the uh, stand singing. Uh, uh, so it's, it's whatever you think violates your self-image. You just do it for a day, and then at the end of the day, you write, why did I do this? What did I learn about myself? And what did I learn about the power of other people? So Phil, you, you told me that story about six years ago at your house, what? and uh, the, 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 what you did in your class. And so I, um, as someone who only wears jeans and black shirts, I went out and bought a pair of orange pants because it makes me feel uncomfortable. Yes. 
So people, people have been, a number of people have paid me compliments today, which I think they just felt sorry for me. But, <laughs> Yeah. Uh, it, it, it draws attention to me and I feel uncomfortable, uh, but because I do it on a regular basis, I don't do it every day, but people, I start getting used to the idea of being uncomfortable and, and sticking out and getting that attention from other people. Yeah. And that's key yeah. to, to stepping out of the crowd to help someone. Yeah, so, so, we, yeah, so that's the social habit. I mean, it's, it's uncomfortable to be a hero there's no question about it. Uh, just as a quick aside, uh, when I did my famous Stanford prison experiment back in 1971, the person who stopped the, the brutality that was going on that I allowed as, as the superintendent of the prison, somebody who loves students, who cares for students, I was allowing the guards to hum dehumanize the prisoners. She looked at that and said, it's horrible what you're doing, it's terrible what you're doing to, to these uh, students. I don't understand who you are. We had just started dating, and she turns to me and says, if this is the real you, I no longer want to have a relationship with you. And that was a slap in the face that brought, brought me to my senses. And I said, you're right, so we have to end the study. But sit, from after that, she said, it was such a lonely thing to do because the students who were working with me in the experiment were her colleagues at Stanford. They were all graduate students together. And so she said, to be a, he she said, to be a hero felt really lonely. And also, what would she do if I said, I'm sorry, I'm gonna continue with the experiment? That, that, that she would sacrifice our romantic relationship, um, my reference for her. So to be a hero, it, after the fact, it's, it's, you know, when you're a successful hero, it's glorious, you get a medal and so forth. Uh, but Thinking about the action and actually why you're doing it in that moment, it's scary and it's, it's lonely. The other thing I would encourage you to do starting today is um, what can you do to make other people feel special? So again, most, most, the worst thing you can do is make people feel anonymous. We call it de-individuation. You look at somebody and you don't remember them or it's, it's a girl or it's, it's a guy or it's an Asian person or, you know, no. Or it's the server, or it's the person who feels you, or it's the, it's the bus driver. So you break through the function, and what do you do? You always ask the name, you work at remembering it, uh, you work at remembering something about them, uh, so that when you see them, you can re remember uh, that they, they, uh, how their hair looked, or the jewelry. And then you make them feel special by giving a justifiable compliment. It's easy with women because they have external, uh, uh, they have jewelry and stuff, but essentially it's not about the jewelry. It's not, gee, what a beautiful necklace. The, the compliment is it makes you look even more lovely. And, you know, or, and then you go from an external thing to internal thing like, I really like what you said about that. That was really interesting. Or, hey, you're a great joke teller. Why don't we give compliments? And it's rare. I mean, compliments are like digging up a dead, a dead animal. Uh, <laughs> nobody <laughs> does it anymore. What I'm saying is I would like you to practice today and tomorrow to give at least two people a compliment, a male and a female, uh, regardless of what you, give it one to a woman and one to a man today and tomorrow. And what happens is when you give a compliment, people smile. They like it because it's, it's rare that anybody does it. And especially giving compliments to people you know are probably never going to get to shy people. Uh, so, so that's the two exercises. Try to do, do something which is positive deviance and also practice being a, uh, making other people feel special. Well, and, and I, think that, I think that complimenting idea is also making you look outside of yourself, right? I think a lot mm. of, what, the, the first thing you need to do when you, uh, in a situation where heroism is called for, is to actually notice that it's called for. And a lot of us walk around in our own little world and uh, you know, I see, you see it out in the, in the lobby today, people um, are in their own little clusters or they're just standing by themselves and that reaching out to other people uh, brings you into the world and thus you, you're, you're, you're more willing, you're more able to help when you know that there are people around you, that you're part of a community. Yeah, absolutely. So that's really key is that when, when I said situational awareness, in every situation you're going in, you know, uh, who are the people I know, who I don't know, who seems shy, lonely, uh, who seems a little sad, when, and if so, then I go and say, hey, how are you, how are you feeling? 
Um, uh, when, when, uh, sometimes um, when I give a big presentation and I sign books or I, people just come up for a hug and a kiss or whatever, a signing thing, you know, for each person, even if the line is 100 people, I will make each one feel special. I, I ask their name uh, before I write it down. I ask if they're a student, what year they're in, what are they studying, what, are, what do they plan to do next. Uh, give a hug, sign a thing, and that takes one minute. And each person, my job is to make each person feel special. Not just a student, not just a fan, and, and it takes one minute. So there I'm making time to make people feel special. And, and it, it, it's, the key is thinking about it before, before I sit down. And so, for example, I will always arrange, when, when I'm signing books, uh, uh, to have a chair next to mine so that when people come up, I say, please sit down. So it's not like they're standing up and I'm signing it. So as soon as they sit down, then we're equals. And then I'm signing the book and, and I'm asking my, so it's, it's controlling the situation in a positive way. And then people leave feeling, you know, they got some spe special self-respect rather than just a book and, and a signature. Yeah, and I think what Phil's trying to say here is that he'll be signing books uh, oh. at six o'clock today. <laughs> Even if you don't buy a book, I'll sign. <laughs> Uh, He's also got DVDs out there, but uh, <laughs> you know, I think the other thing uh, uh, with, with all of these small things that you've been talking about is that they are all still a little difficult and it's, it's tough to be the first person and I think we saw earlier today there was a call to come and dance on stage in front of 600 people and it took one or two people to show everyone else that oh, it's okay and all of a sudden we had a right. party up on the stage. Right. Yeah, and all, and all the research on the bystanders um, that uh, we've actually done, done uh, demonstrations. So we, had, we did research in London. We have a woman lying on the steps, tr attractive woman, f reason, re reasonably well-dressed, lying on the steps of a, a bu busy um, train station, Liverpool station in London. Uh, clearly unconscious, lying there like this, and then we start, she got, lies down, and then we start, it, we start a clock. How long does it take before somebody passes? In five minutes, something like 35 people pass by within a foot of her, and no one stops. And we stop the camera, and we ask students, what's happening? Why are people not stopping? Clearly, it's not a danger. It's not like, you know, some, you know uh, helping would not be dangerous. People don't have the time, they're not interested. And then the question is, what happens when somebody stops? Within six seconds, when somebody stops, a second person stops, and suddenly the norm has changed. So the, pro the bystander effect is really that even when you're in a group of strangers, you look around to see what is the right thing you should do. When other people don't, don't do anything, the norm is do nothing, mind your own business. Soon as somebody helps, the new norm is help, do something. And so the basic notion of heroes is humanity is my business. I help strangers in the same way I would be helping my, my children, my, my, my best friend, because it's in the same way if I'm lying there and somebody doesn't know me, I want them to pick me up regardless. I want them to call for help. So the other thing we talk about is The biggest problem I have in trying to promote the notion of everyday heroes, ordinary heroes, uh, people who do ordinary deeds each day to make the world better in some way, is mothers who have the, the old view of heroes. Heroes take risky actions and they die. Uh, and I don't want my child to die. And we say, of course not. The key to heroism is wise and effective action. Situation, you read the situation dangerous, you call the police. You call 911 or whatever the service is. You say, hey, she needs help. Uh, you never do it alone. We talk about creating hero squads. Uh, this is one of the things I'd like, again, students to do in your class. You know, check out what's, you know, what, is there a problem in your school? That's the things, aside from bullying or any other thing, is you're much more effective uh, as, as the young people uh, talk, talk today about Irina Sendlerova, Sendlera, uh, she gets the credit for saving 2,500 Polish Jewish children, but she had a team of 25 other people, 24 women and one guy, as she mentioned. Now, women are better at her heroism than men in a network. Women are just used to social networks, women network. Guys are loners. 
So most male heroes are loners. They do a solitary thing. Most heroic deeds with women are almost always within a network. So again, help develop social networks in your, in your school, in your class, but form hero squads to say, hey, what is the problem in our school? You know, uh, is there a problem with littering? Is there a problem with graffiti? Is there a problem with bullying? That, that you alone can't handle, but get two or three friends. The other thing is with whistleblowing, and we're going to have a wonderful session tomorrow. Whistleblow, there's two kinds of heroes. There is the impulsive, reactive hero, that you see some bad thing happening. There's a fire, there's an emergency. Uh, we had this wonderful, amazing case in New York. Uh, oh, we're going to have, we're going to have uh, Chad tomorrow? He's not going to make oh, it. Okay, well, there's this amazing case in New York two years ago on a railroad subway station in New York City uh, where subways, if you're in New York, you know, subways come in every three, every three minutes. There's 75 people on the, on the station and there's a guy who stumbles and falls off uh, the, uh, the platform and it's, it's a, this high, falls down across the tracks. And you know that the train is going to cut him in half, okay, the wheels of the subway. There's a man, African-American man, 50-year-old, Wesley Autry, and he's there with his two little girls. He looks down, he looks over, and everybody is looking the other way. Everybody's saying nothing. He turns to, to Stray and says, please take care of my kids, jumps down on the platform, picks the guy up from between the tracks, puts, across, puts him between the tracks, presses down, and the train goes over his head, and he, he, they barely survive. The difference between the top of his head and, and the bottom of the train was one half an inch. Had it been a half an inch more, he would have been decapitated. It would have been a horrible disaster. Um, so that's a reactive, impulsive hero. Now, sadly, our visit tomorrow, a guest was going to come, who, who saw the video of this, and he was in New York. Two weeks later, the same exact thing happened. What did he do? He jumped down the platform. He pulled the guy to the platform edge, called for help. Two guys came. They picked him up. Uh, they saved his life. This guy, Chad, got on the train and went to work. That's a wise hero. Wesley Autry was an unwise hero. <laughs> he did an impulsive thing that could have cost his life. The other kind of hero is a whistleblower. A whistleblower notices there's some bad shit happening. There's corruption, there's, there's theft, uh, people are stealing in, 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 the, in, the, in my business. Uh, and this is all the way at the national level. You're going to hear Dan Ellsberg who was a whistleblower who stopped the Vietnam War by, by realizing that our generals were lying, our generals were telling our presidents for many years that the war in Vietnam cannot be won. But nevertheless, we don't know how to exit gracefully. And our presidents would lie to the Americans saying, uh, we're winning the war, all we need is more money, more bombs, and so forth. And he, he took the risk of exposing that uh, because that is, uh, to do so made, made him a traitor, a spy. And he could have gone to prison for a hundred years. He's and stealing his story. The steal oh, but he no. So, but he's he's going to come and talk about uh, uh, the decisions he had to make. Uh, and uh, and there are other 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 whistleblowers um, who simply. But the difference between the reactive hero who acts on the moment, they ha they take time. That is, they have to collect information. Often they have to get other people on their side uh, so that they're not. Uh, uh, dealt with as a you know f fanatic, so but the interesting thing for students here, especially the uh, more advanced students, there is almost no systematic research on heroism. What is the difference between a reactive hero like Wesley Autry and and a, a reflective hero like Dan Ellsberg? We don't know. Nobody's done the research. It's so so obvious that it must be, and I'm telling you that uh, there is a whole area of research that is begging for students to be, and teachers to be involved in. So that's a good, good segue. Um, let, me, let me summarize what we just talked about, though, for, for you guys that are inspired to start training for heroism tomorrow. You should start being a positive deviant. Get some orange pants or put a square on your forehead or something that's going to make people look at you. I've suggested that uh, people go to Genesee Valley Mall and walk around backwards for half an hour. People are going to look at you and laugh at you and take pictures and send them to their friends. You're going to feel uncomfortable. The other thing is to start looking out of yourself and paying compliments. And we're talking about building a team. Get a group of people to help you fix a problem. So on this issue of research, 
That leads us to discussion about your heroic imagination project, which has been going for five years. More than that now. More than years. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so for many years, <clears throat> I studied evil. I studied evil in an unusual way <clears throat> by trying to create it in the laboratory, doing research like the Stanford Prison Study, other research. <clears throat> and, and my interest in evil came again from growing up in, in a ghetto in the South Bronx, in, in total poverty. My family was on welfare for many, many years. <clears throat> um, and if you grow up in any inner city, there are men whose job it is to corrupt kids, to do bad things for money. If you're rich, you don't, get, you don't do anything for money. You just ask your parents or you do some chores or something, you mow the lawn. Uh, but if you're poor, these, you take drugs, you sell drugs, you steal, you cheat. Uh, if you're a girl, they get you to sell your body. Uh, and so I had friends who did that, and I and other friends didn't. So as a kid, I was always, what's the difference between kids who give in to temptation, because we said the Lord's Prayer every night, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, and kids who resist it. Um, my analysis as a little kid was it had always to do with having a strong, strong present mother. Uh, most kids didn't have fathers, but the mother made the, seemed to me to make the big difference. And then as I got older, I, I began to his psychology, uh, and, and psychology is interested in human nature, human behavior. So I began to study <clears throat> evil as a psychologist. <clears throat> and then in recent times, I said, you know, I wrote a book, The Looser Effect, you know, which summarizes all the research I'd done on evil. And in the last chapter, I said, you know, in every situation of evil, like, like evil of the Nazis with Irina Sendler, uh, the evil of, uh, in, in, in terrible things gangs do, there's always somebody who resists, even in all the research. You know, not all the guards in my prison study did bad things. Some of them were, in quote, good guards. So I, I raised the question for myself, what's, you know, what is it about the people who can resist the power of situations that, that most, that the majority gets sucked into? And that led me to think about what does it mean to be a hero? And then heroes are, you know, we looked at the Joseph Campbell model, and I just began to think, heroes are not born. Heroes are made. You learn how to be a hero. And can we train? Can we have really a training program to take anybody, virtually anybody, and train them how to be a hero, develop the social habits of heroism. Uh, and as a teacher, my focus was, can we develop uh, a course? Can we develop um, a course where it's, we call it understanding human nature? Your human nature and the nature of other people. And this course is, we want to revolutionize education uh, everywhere uh, around the world we're doing it, and hopefully starting very soon in Flint. Um, where it's six, we start with six lessons in great detail. Um, uh, so for example, like the bystander, how do you transform passive bystanders into active heroes? Uh, how do you, people mention this, uh, mindset. Mindset means you think about the world of here's what I can do and here's what I can't do. Here's, here's, here's what people of this kind do and here's what people of this kind can't do. How do you know that? This is false beliefs. You can do almost anything with practice, the dedication, determination, uh, as our, our, our basketball coach said. Uh, but we have this notion of a fixed mindset. I'm no good at chess. I'm good at, I'm good at writing. Why am I no good at chess? It seemed hard. I never did it. Uh, I didn't seem to have that skill. But then I label myself as not good at something when, in fact, I could be. Uh, I'm not good at, at uh, playing the piano. Well, I had lessons when I was a kid and I didn't like it. Well, it turns out if I think back, the piano teacher was not really very good. It was not really inspiring. It was made you play chords endlessly. Uh, if I did a Suzuki method, I probably would be playing the piano for you right now. Uh, uh, so, so, so we have these lessons on conformity, on obedience. But what's unique about the lessons is they're all organized around videos because we know young people are visually oriented. So we show a video of that woman lying on the steps, and the first question the teacher asks the class is, what, do you, what are the people thinking by not helping? And then, then the next question is, what, do you, what would you do if you were in that situation? Everybody says I would help. What's the difference between sitting here, looking at the thing, and being in the situation? Well, that's where social norms come in. And then, so, so the whole lesson is organized around uh, six or eight videos 
uh, which are in inspiring. There's typically not a right answer or a wrong answer, but it gets kids talking. Now, teachers don't lecture. Students answer, they write down their answer, and the students respond to each other. So tell your partner a time when somebody needed your help, and you helped. So you write down uh, your name, and so, and how did you feel? I felt pride. Now, when was a situation you were in, and somebody needed your help, and you didn't help, when you could have? Write down that situation. How do you feel? Shame. It, typically, it's something that students have never said, and it's almost always, I didn't help a friend who was being bullied or hurt, or some kid whose who's, uh, father or his mother was abusing them. And now you share it with your best friend in class. The teacher says, if you want to share with the class, you can, but you don't have to. So it goes like that. And then, for example, the teacher says, you know, we've learned many things today. What are the three most important lessons you're going to take home? That's the final exam. There's no exam next week. The teacher goes around and checks and says, no, no, it's not bystand affect. Affect means emotion. It's effect. Checks it off. And that's the exam. And then the next thing is, every student should be a teacher. It's the reason, to be, the reason to be educated is not just to be smart to get an A. It's now you have knowledge that can change the world. So the next thing is, who will you share one thing you learned today? You write down, I feel Zimbardo will share with Cora Keen uh, that uh, in a bystander situation, da 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 the Teacher notes it, next day, what did Cora say? Hey, she said that was really interesting. She never, never thought about it. Could you do that one last, could you tell Cora to tell one other person? Now, what we've done, we've taken material, we've uh, inspired students not only to understand and learn it, we've made them a social change agent, thinking of themselves now as teachers, and actually sharing the knowledge. And, that, and now we create a knowledge network. We are doing this in Poland, we're doing this in, in, uh, in uh, Budapest, Hungary, and we're even doing it in Corleone, Sicily. Corleone, as you know from the movie, is the godfather town. My, my family is Sicilian, and so the mayor of this town is going to have our program there, we obviously translated to Italian, uh, starting in October. So I'm really excited that, that these lessons, and in fact, Cora Keen just did a training here uh, over the weekend, uh, and we hope our program is going to be the number of, of schools, high schools, maybe middle schools, and even colleges in Flint and around. Matt's program is, his hero, his hero construction uh, program, is really for primary school. So we hope we can have from primary school all the way it, to college, combining the best of our programs with the help of the amazing team we're developing in Flint, with L. Jack and, and, and others. So that's, uh, and we, we can finish up with a, a broader discussion about that, I think, is the Heroic Imagination Project is coming to Flint, Michigan. It's, it's in Poland, it's in Hungary, it's in Hong Kong, Sicily, Sicily. Uh, but nowhere in America has it been really no. grabbed onto yet. And Flint has taken that on. And so we have... Uh, <laughs> so... <laughs> in the audience today, we have uh, a number of people that have been working very hard on getting that to happen. And as Phil said, there was a training this weekend for the first kind of batch of, of hero trainers. And uh, Neetha and Ali are in the crowd somewhere. They are, where are they? Stand up. Stand up. So a lot of you uh, are here today because Neetha called you and told you you need to come, <laughs> or, or Ali called you uh, and suggested you come. Uh, those two are putting together a non-profit mission to uh, create Hero Town Flint USA, something that is going to be a model for the nation. Whole nation. Tomorrow, uh, in one of the breakout sessions, uh, Cora Keane, as Phil said, one of the trainers for the Heroic Imagination Project, is going to be giving information about the program. If you want your school involved, if you want your business involved, if you want to be involved personally, uh, you should see her tomorrow at the breakout session. She'll be pl presenting a, uh, some of one of the modules on the, the bystander effect. So Phil, could you, we've got five minutes okay. left. Can you tell us what Flint would look like five years down the road from 
adopting Hero Town Flint USA? Yeah, um, to be to be perfectly honest, uh, my my uh, when I was invited here last year, I, I went online, checked about Flint. I was scared to come here. I mean, it's homicide capital of America, violence capital of America, uh, lowest graduation rate from high school of any major city. Uh, there are whole neighborhoods that nobody ever goes into because it's too dangerous. Uh, and what was paradox, I'm driving, cars driving around these beautiful streets, tree-lined streets, everything looked lovely. Then I started to notice abandoned house, abandoned house, foreclosed, one person foreclosed. The school is closed because there's no children around there. Um, and suddenly I said, you know, here is a potentially, and then downtown is obviously being fixed up. So I said, here's a potential crucible of change uh, that, that I, would I, I want to be involved in because, again, coming, coming from the South Bronx, from an ugly, physically ugly place where there were no trees. You, ha you have trees. We had no trees. We had no grass. Where there were flowers. Um, that that um, my sense is this is a model for what could be done if we get teamwork. We get hero squads everywhere. Not only adults, but kids. We've got to get kids involved because we, want, we got to change your school. We've got, to, we've got to make it, the program we have, we think, will make you love l this new kind of learning. But that's only, that's only the beginning. The other thing in our program is we have a program we call Health Heroes, meaning young people taking charge of the health of their family. If you can get one person in your family who smokes to stop smoking, you save a life. It's like jumping in a river to save a drowning person. But it's not easy to do. So again, we have programs where you go online, you sign up, say, I'm going to try to change my father's smoking. And we have a whole thing. How many cigarettes does he smoke? When does he smoke? What is your goal? And then we put you in a team with other kids. But also, we know the, the importance of, of uh, physical exercise, uh, the, the negative effects of obesity. So these are health problems in every family. Learn, getting people in your family to exercise together, or with you and them, uh, is critical. There's recent research on the importance of physical exercise in dealing with all major illnesses. Simply exercising, it's like 100 minutes a week. Well, how do you give up 100? You can only do it when you have a, a, a person, we think young people in a family working with, with others. Uh, the other program we have is health uh, tech heroes. High school kids going to homes for the elderly and teaching them how to use the internet develop their own Facebook page, uh, learning how to write to relatives who don't visit them, learning how to send guilt messages. Uh, <laughs> but, and we've done this for two years, and the kids form a bond with the, these elderly people. They, they do it, they call it um, service learning. So the students get credit for it. And then the last exercise is do a video of the heroes of the elderly person. Some of these elderly people were during the Second World War, during earlier wars, and they have a whole life that you, didn't, that you never shared as a young person. And so many of our, our high school students have really formed a personal bond with, with, the elderly, with their elderly student. Uh, so again, these are little programs we can add on to our, our uh, hero project, uh, Flint USA. Yeah, and I think the, the other thing to mention too is uh, that Hero Town Flint USA is a nonprofit. It's already uh, benefited from donations from a number of people in the community and, and very, very much uh, uh, diplomat Phil Hageman and Jeff Rowe have been very supportive of this mission. They continue to be so. And I think uh, th there's great evidence there that diplomat as a whole is very supportive of this by the number of people with diplomat shirts here today. Uh, so thank you very much. So I, uh, I want to finish by thanking Phil. I'm, I'm really glad that you did turn up last year, even though you were scared, and that you came back again this year. Um, you know, Phil's work has been uh, certainly an inspiration to a lot of the people that have spoken today. I know people have interviewed him, uh, so he continues to be an inspiration in this study, in this movement, in these efforts. So thank you very much, Phil Zimbardo. Let's go, sir. Okay.
The Hero Roundtables are the global events that ask the question, what is a hero? You've just seen one hero talk. To find more and join the conversation, visit our website or social media.